Is modern worship music just emotional manipulation? Well, as a church of one life, the church I pastor, has always been associated with modern worship music. We're known to be loud, we have concert lighting, electric guitars, drums, the whole package. But is that all that's going on? Now, if you listen to some in the Christian world and on YouTube, they would say, yes, that's exactly what's going on. Well, I disagree. So what I'm gonna do is to share why I differ from that opinion, biblically, theologically, logically, and even historically, after saying this one little caveat. So I can sympathize with some criticism leveled at churches who have provided a large share of the modern worship music. So this is not a blanket endorsement of churches or modern worship music writers per se. Some of the criticisms, in my view, are deserved. And that's true of nearly any sector in the church world. But on that note, we would do well to stop making broad overgeneralization like modern worship music is emotional manipulation or mega churches are destroying Christianity anyway. It's like saying Christian YouTube creators are destroying Christianity, which I hope isn't true. Are there good YouTubers? Sure. Are there bad ones? Yes. But here's a few reasons I would caution against saying modern worship music is emotional manipulation. Let me give you a few reasons I would caution against saying modern worship music is emotional manipulation. Number one, saying that is an assignment of motive. It's really not a comment on the music, it's a charge against the people writing, performing, or even deciding to include certain songs in a worship set. What we're saying when we say that is, those people who came up with those songs are motivated by wanting to manipulate people as opposed to wanting people to engage in worship or connect with the message in a song. So who on earth has the discernment to see a heart motive? The closest thing we can come to is to watch people's lives and character. I've worked with some absolutely amazing, Jesus-loving, biblically-centered, integrity-filled worship leaders who pick so-called modern songs and who are motivated by one thing, wanting people to genuinely worship from the inside out with passion and truth. I've seen it with my own eyes. It's shallow thinking to assume just because a song is played with drums and a Gibson Les Paul, its motives are suspect. And that leads me to the second point. It's tiring and it's inaccurate to think that new equals bad and old equals good. Can we just stop talking that way? There are things that have taken place in the past that are very good and should be respected, even repeated. There are eras of Christian awakening in history that are very good, and there are eras in the past that are very bad, too. The Bible records both. The way life usually goes is we experience both at the exact same time. I've always been a very thankful for uh, the books of 1 and 2 Corinthians. Uh, they give us a glimpse into the church in the first century that was struggling and falling down on a lot of issues. They were divided. They had issues with sexual immorality. They were even at odds with the Apostle Paul. Some of them even said his speaking in person amounted to nothing. They were around a very long time ago and were part of the golden era of church history. Yet they were still people. Bad things still happened back then too. Now we tend to transfer this idea of the old was good and the new is bad over to music maybe more than any other subject, so much that it's pretty much a cliche. Studies have shown that the music you listen to the most between the ages of 13 and 16 for boys and 11 and 14 for girls will become your favorite music throughout the rest of your life. So often when we prefer the old, we're pretty much just saying we prefer that which we heard in the formative time of our lives. We have a true emotional attachment to these songs and the experiences associated with them. But let's make sure we remember that some of us were teenagers during a different era than other people. Also, always remember, every single old song you love was once a new song. Amazing Grace was brand new at one time and introduced to a congregation who had never heard it before. And without a doubt, when it was introduced, there were some in the room who said, why do we have to play the new song? Why don't we just play the old songs? I like those better. Or this new song feels like nothing more than a feel-good song. All that talk about grace is obviously just emotional manipulation. Number three. It's a strange accusation to say modern worship music is emotionally manipulative because all music is inherently emotional. Someone has said if emotions made a sound, it would be music. The most basic knowledge of music tells you that. Music played in a major key typically is viewed as more upbeat and emotionally positive. Minor keys are more introspective and darker. And our experience of music in every area of life is fitted to the feel of the situation. We play one kind of song for a wedding, we play another uh, kind at a funeral, still another at a football game. In short, if you're playing any kind of music at all, you are in the realm of emotions. And when it comes to emotion, you're handed the reality of what music does, and then you have to decide, 
Are we being manipulative? If one song sounds more appropriate to the situation or the passage or the theme than another, then by choosing it, are you being manipulative? Now consider the book of Psalms in the Bible. There is a long and well-established history that for the first few centuries of the church's existence, singing songs that were not in the Psalms in public worship wasn't even allowed. Uh, songs that were not psalms were called songs by uninspired men. Now, hardly any church traditions follow that rule anymore. But imagine going back to that. You would have to throw out Amazing Grace, How Great Thou Art, A Mighty Fortress Is Our God, not to mention Jesus What a Beautiful Name. But thought experiment here. What if you went back to that idea, which I don't think is the worst idea in the world, and you, you would have to use lyrics from the Psalms. You could put them to any music you wanted, but you had to use the lyrics from the Psalms. What would happen? Now what makes the inspiration of the Psalms so amazing is that they reflect nearly every imaginable emotional state of the human heart. One of the most enriching spiritual disciplines I ever did was to pray my way through the Psalms. And this is an ancient practice I highly recommend to anyone. What it taught me was how to worship from my my emotional starting place. There are psalms which brim over with joy and enthusiasm. There are psalms which reflect anger and calls for justice. There are many, many psalms that are called laments, and that's another name for songs coming from a difficult place of sadness, heartache, questioning, struggling. Listen to this small sample from Psalm 69. Save me, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out from calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. Now this is a very powerful, if a little bit depressing, deeply personal, vivid poetry, and it is very emotional. It's designed to be. If you have ever been depressed or afraid or hurting, the idea of having water come up to your neck and having no foothold is a very good description of that experience. And it's a beautiful thought that the God of the universe breathed out those words to give those of us who are hurting a way to express ourselves that we don't have on our own. That's the design of the Psalms. They're training us in how to take our emotions into a place of worship. That's one of the roles of music. It expresses the inexpressible. Are those lyrics emotional manipulation? Of course not. I think they're better described as emotional contact and inspiration. Uh, they meet you where you are and they train you to move toward God from any emotional place by connecting with you emotionally and giving you a solid intellectual content. And that's a very important lesson that we all need. And I would argue, in, a, in certain respects, modern music does that very well. Because for one, it has the sound that I connect to emotionally and aesthetically, while giving me a way to onboard my emotions into worship lyrically. As a matter of fact, I think it's better at that than some older traditions. Here's why. Modern songs leave space and encourage fuller range of expression, a range you find in the Psalms. The Psalms have literal calls to worship by uh, playing skillfully on stringed instruments, shouting, clapping your hands, clashing on cymbals even dancing. You know, some traditions, many of them would be critical of modern worship music, would never dream of incorporating any of those expressions into their worship, even though we're told directly to do it in the Psalms. So what's viewed as emotional manipulation because it happens to be expressive just might be more like obedience. Now, when it comes to the role of worship music in your life, no matter what tradition you're a part of, if you want to see it enriched, the best thing to do is to come to a deeper understanding of why God seems to want all the singing and all the music in worship of Him. And for that, we've produced this video. Check it out. Hope all of that helps. See you next time.